All right. Good day, fellas. Welcome to Uncensored Advice for Men. On today's show, we're going to have a conversation with my new friend, Jason, who's going to share his story, share some things that have inspired him to make some massive changes in his own life and how he's leveraged that to help other people. Jason, welcome to the show. Josh, thanks for having me, brother. Yeah. All right. So guys, you might be listening in to the podcast. You might be watching it on YouTube, but let me describe what I see. I see a cool looking dude with tattoos on his arm in the background. I see Batman. I see all these action figures and, and, uh, it, it looks like he's in a, uh, an environment of fun. Uh, Jason, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what do, why, why do you have that stuff in your background and what, what does that represent? Yeah, I'm in a, I'm in an apartment in Dallas. Uh, we have an apartment in Denver. There's nothing special about our apartments. They're really small. You know, but when you have to be in two places at once, then it, it just makes it a little bit easier. But Dallas is home. And uh, like I think of I think of home as a bigger version of the bedroom that you had when you were a kid, you know, and uh, and I collect toys. I've always collected toys. When I was a kid, we didn't have toys. We didn't have anything. It was I was probably eight or nine before we got a Nintendo. It was a shared, uh, it was like a shared gift for the family. Uh, but I was like seven or eight when I got this little Kenner Luke Skywalker action figure. And I had never had one before. I had never seen an action figure before. And I took a push pin and I put it on my wall. And I used to stare at him before I would go to bed. And so anyway, whenever I went to, I think it was Tom Thumb at the time, it might have been Skaggs, uh, I saw another action figure at the store, and it was a little R2-D2, and I bought that, and I put it in a push pin beside my wall. And so from the time I was a kid, I never wanted to play with my toys, I just wanted to put them on the shelf and enjoy them, you know, and so now, like, <laughs> you know, it's really funny, because I have like this little two and a half year old son running around. And, and he, he doesn't mess with anything. He loves looking at it and everything, but it's like, he's already, he already understands. He has his toys that he plays with on the floor, but then everything else that's on the, the walls, he sits on my shoulders and, and I talk to him about, you know, this figure came from this comic book and this figure came from this. And so, yeah. Yeah. All right. So I don't want this to happen. But for some reason, a huge flood's coming. We just had some hurricanes in Florida. Huge flood's coming. It's going to wipe out Colorado apartment. We're going to wipe out the Dallas apartment. But you could grab one piece of memorabilia, just one, that is the most important to you. Which is that and why? Yeah. Uh, uh, probably just uh, it's going to be one of the kids' toys. You know, like if there's a couple of little, there's a couple of, as far as the collecting, the collection, the collection, the memorabilia and everything, there are some things that are greatly tied to my kids. Uh, my daughter has this pop uh, action figure that has a, an autograph from Curran Walters. It's like her from the doctor. Uh, my son has a, um, a, a Superman cape that he wears around. And so of the action figures and the memorabilia, disregarding family stuff, pictures and everything, I'd probably grab her pop and then I would grab his cape. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. So, And then I would probably tell him that he was the one that saved the house. You know, man, I'm so <laughs> glad that we got your cape. <laughs> you made it, buddy. You saved yeah, the day, exactly. little exactly. Superman. So, you know, as I look at, you know, your LinkedIn, I see a guy with a sports coat, you know, you look like Dallas. I lived in Dallas. My son was born in uh, Grapevine and, you know, we lived there for a little bit and I walked around in a sports coat and cowboy boots. And I, you know, I let the part fit the part. Now I'm, you know, in a tank top, but in Florida, but, you know, I, I look at this and I see, you know, Jason Criddle and associates insurance investments, infrastructure, like, like, tell me a little bit about who you are in the professional side of uh, Jason. Yeah, yeah, I've been in uh I've been in software investments for a while. I went from I I would walk around comfortably at 365 to 400 pounds. Wow. Uh I'm on my fifth time of losing more than 100 pounds in my life. I come from a naturally obese family. If I'm not 100% dedicated in the gym and to my diet, then my body just balloons. 
And so I have to be all in. And then the very moment, you know, you, you're like, oh, I missed the gym today. I'll go tomorrow. And then it's been three months. And that's just how my life has always been. And so whenever it came to my body, uh, now I'm doing things a little bit differently because I'm getting older. I lost my mom to cancer. Uh, but I lost all this weight. I became a personal trainer and a nutritionist. Uh, I helped 500 people lose 9,000 pounds in this really cool case study that I did. I got to stand in front of people and talk to them about my story. Uh, that led to me writing some books. Eventually, I started a publishing company and started helping small business owners write books. The small business owners needed websites. I got into building websites, ran across a broker, built a website for a broker, and then learned investments. And that was eight years ago. And then my life just changed. Um, you know, not only did I start uh, working differently, but I started seeing life differently. I started, uh, you know, I I had already I had been in business before as a kid. I was that young entrepreneur that was always working hard. But I guess over the course of the last eight to 10 years, even being a personal trainer and realizing that I was capped at my time and then turning my personal training company into a nonprofit so that I could educate a lot of people, it allowed me to help more people. Whenever I, you know, I used to have this huge long schedule, you know what it's like being a personal trainer where you're in the gym all day. And I condensed that down to an hour or two and told everybody to meet me in the gym at this time. And this is where we're going to work out. And so this methodology of scaling started coming in and started using that to help people build their businesses and thrive. Because, you know, from being in the fitness industry, Man, there's a lot of information out there and there's so many diets and there's all this, there's fads and there's whatever. There's there's everything that you could possibly think of that could waste your time except going to the gym. But going to the gym is the solution. Not putting the crap in your mouth is the solution. And people will literally find 98 other things to do rather than do those two things. From a business perspective, I get rid of those 98 other things and we focus on the two. Mm -hmm. And so learning how to change a body and fitness really helped push me into seeing results in business. What's, what's interesting is if you didn't have that experience with your own personal weight loss and then work at a gym where it's like, man, I'm making 12 bucks an hour in the gym client after client, the only way to make more money is to take on more clients and sleep less, right? And you go, I got to figure out a way to scale this. Everybody meet at the same time. Hey, that's a right. good spot, right? Group, group fitness. So now it's multiplying. But you've taken these philosophies and such, and then you started doing other work for people, building websites, running a publishing arm. And then you learned investments. And but you're, you're, you're like, tacking on these different principles to, to now get to where you are. What if you didn't go the route of the gym? What if you didn't go the route of losing your own weight? Like, what would that look like today? Like you said you've lost like over 400 pounds or something like crazy. What would that look like today? Whenever I had my daughter, I'm so glad that I had my daughter first. I have a 13 year old daughter. I have a two year old son. I'm glad I had my daughter first because I was a wreck when my daughter was born. I was an asshole, typical. I was angry at my father, even though I hadn't seen my father in a dozen years. And I was just having sex for no other reason than to just do it. Um, you know, and I slowed down on that. And then whenever I slowed down on that and decided to like get into a relationship, my daughter comes along. The relationship didn't work out, but I ended up gaining custody of my daughter. And so <clears throat> even whenever I held her at this young age, like I knew that I was going to have to change because I, I mean, it was just like the snap, you know, like my daughter's going to fall in love with me. She's going to fall in love with this guy that I am. And so I have to, I have to kind of turn into some other guy. 
And so now that I have my son, I'm really glad that I have my son because I was able to turn into this guy, this loving father, this loving husband, all these things before I have my son, you know? And so now my son gets to experience me as this father, uh, this grown father. Man, all this really comes down to my life. I really feel like, you know, now I just turned 40. I just, I, I turned 40 on July 23rd. Happy I call birthday. this my, thanks, man. I call this my line in the sand year. Yeah. And I'm just really beginning to realize that all I, all I, all I do now is I'm trying to recreate what I wanted for myself whenever I was a kid. My parents, even though, uh, even though my mom provided, my mom didn't have access to technology or experiences or you know or or anything that i do now hmm. it's only because i've had access to these opportunities that i am who i am so whenever i look back at the opportunities that i've had and like you said i really feel like these principles and these mannerisms and these behaviors have stacked up to where it's allowed me to create this company that's just based off of me. And it's weird. It's it's really weird to think about that. Like when people ask me what I do for a living, I, I don't know. Like I'm sitting here talking to you. <laughs> like, like, but I'm really good at communicating with people. All these little things helped me communicate with people. Like if I hadn't had the opportunity to hold my daughter, then I would have never had the desire to lose weight. If I hadn't had that desire to lose weight, I never, you know, I got a personal trainer. When I got a personal trainer, I was like, man, I really love this feeling. I could, I could reproduce this feeling in other people to see progress, to see change in their body. But even being the personal trainer was capped, you know? So I, I got to the point now at a 40 year old man where I'm really just beginning to learn that I believe that I was in some way, shape or form chosen to go through these experiences, to be where I am now so that I could do the things that I want to do for the world. The only reason why I'm good at investments is not because I enjoy making money. It's because I have bigger plans for the planet. So being chosen for the challenges, right? Like you could look at one way and, the, and people will say like, life doesn't happen, you know, to you, it happens for you, right? And you're right. like, bullshit, like that sucks, right? Like, I don't want to be the guy who, you know, like, all right, Josh, you're going to do some great stuff. Here's a bunch of, you know, heartaches and hurdles and challenges of life. I didn't want that. But if I look back in my life, I wouldn't be... I consider myself a pretty decent dude, right? Love my wife, love my kids, love my God, love my community. Like I'm turning into a decent dude. If I didn't go through those challenges, I do not think I would have the same appreciation for my wife, for my God, for my community, for my kids. So like I could look back and I could be like, I didn't want those challenges or I don't want those challenges for my kids or those challenges were the best thing that's ever happened to me. You were chosen for the challenges that you faced. Name some of them and the positive effects that it had because of those. You know, it's funny is I believe what's one of the major things that's happening right now in society as a whole uh, is men aren't being challenged. I call it men without missions, like what we're dealing with right now we have a whole bunch of men that aren't working towards anything together. So yeah. Did you want to touch on a thought before I nah, man run with it? I took a deep breath yeah. because Holy moly, like, you know, in some of the stuff that I've written or, or, uh, the reason of the show is, is closely aligned with what you're saying, man. So keep running, man. It yeah. was just a sigh. Like I feel you, dude. I'm right. With you. Our life the reason why our lives are so mediocre is because our lives don't suck enough. And I really want people to grasp that. 
I know way too many 40 and 50 year old men whose mothers are still alive and these men have not evolved past the stage of being a 13 year old that's sitting at mom's house being taken care of on the weekends. And so that's the society that we're living in. Whenever you look at these crime rates that we're going that are going up, we can blame color if we want. Or we can we can blame the socio-political status or what or we can blame the real problem which is boredom people are bored we have nothing to do we have no time to be bored there is so much crap to watch on my tv that it's boring and so now we have no time to sit around and be creative we've isolated ourselves so much in the in the name of being strong and independent people that we don't have friends anymore. People go to parks and concerts now and they stand close together while they're talking on their phones. And the people that they're talking on their phones to, they have no connection with. And so in the middle of all this, you have a whole bunch of boys that are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s in some cases, that have decided not to have children. We've decided that, oh, I'm too smart for any woman that's out there that I could possibly be attracted to. And video game sports and the bro code is more important than evolving into what God put us, us here for, which is to be God's children, bring people to God's kingdom, be fruitful and multiply. Man, we're supposed to be eating healthy food and raising kids we're not supposed to be doing this shit that we're living in right now and there's not enough men on the planet right now to make any kind of real change there's more people that are willing to make anonymous accounts online and attack other men who are actually trying to make a difference and so until we get past the point where we realize that we're not, I saw this meme the other day and Josh, it was so beautiful. It said the world is not separated by religion and skin color and race. It's separated by wise men and fools and fools separate themselves into religious religions and race and color. Our planet is dying we are dying as a species and we're becoming angrier with each other when we should be coming together. And so me even coming on your show today is us having an opportunity to talk, have real talk like this about the changes that we need to actively be involved in. Anybody who's listening to this podcast needs to grab their closest friend and have this same fucking conversation. It's time for us to start coming together, man. Like we need, we can be better husbands. We can be better fathers. We can be better people. We can be better businessmen, but it's going to take us all realizing that we need each other and that we're not strong and independent. We're actually very dependent on each other. And we have these blinders on that are, keeping us away from each other so yeah man i i love the i love the the path of thinking is that that we have to come together to create change right we have to come together to create positive effects when we're divide when we're divided we can't in your life, you said you've gone through some challenges that you've been chosen for challenges, right? Let, let me bring back to this question because I think we, we found a, a soapbox for a minute and I'm thankful for it. But right. name some of the challenges, right? So one of the challenges you said is, you know, wait, you came from a family of obesity. Do you think that comes from not being on mission? What are your thoughts? And then the thing that switched for you is one day you had your daughter and you said, I need to become a different man. So you hired a trainer went to the gym, you made the changes, and you had big success in your own world that led you to help others. What other challenges have you faced and how, what were some of the positive outcomes for you? You know, you said something uh, earlier and I say it all the time. 
usually the worst things that happen to us end up being like some of the greatest things to ever happen to us. It sure. ends up being the best day of our lives in whatever case. And like you said, yes, it also starts to change whenever you start realizing that things are happening to you. This this sounds really messed up, but I'm going to share it. I was actually talking about it yesterday with my assistant. When I was a kid, my dad hurt me a lot. He abused me. Um, the extent of the abuse doesn't matter. What matters is this man used to say that he was doing what he was doing he called it discipline that's fine uh he was doing it because god told him to and i and i heard that my entire childhood to the point to where like i like denounced god whenever i was a kid didn't want to have anything to do with god which completely destroyed every idea of what i had as the unit of a father mm -hmm. but man we could go on for hours about that so <clears throat> You fast forward all these years of me being so angry at my father, of me having lived with the scars of abuse for so long. And then I have this daughter. I have this beautiful little girl, Emma. And, you know, whenever I learned that she was on her way, I was really scared to be a father because I was really scared that I was going to be this like abusive father like my father was. It was like a genuine fear that I had. And then when I held her for the first time, I was like, there's no way that I could ever hurt this little thing. Well, she was being abused by her birth mother and stepfather. I would eventually get custody of her, um, which was a challenge in and of itself just because of being a father in the court system and, and trying to um, take on the responsibility of a daughter. I remember not only was I able to recognize these signs of abuse before my daughter was talking, but I just remember this instance where she was having a panic attack for the first time, and she only had a vocabulary of about five or ten words, and I'm trying to explain to my three-year-old daughter, who doesn't really understand how to communicate, but I understand what she's going through. And it took her having that panic attack and throwing up on me before she was going back to her mother, before I realized what was going on. I put out a restraining order against her mother and stepfather, and I fought for custody. I fought for a year and a half, and I got her. She's 13 years old now. She's wonderful. She's amazing. <clears throat> there is no way that my daughter would have been able to endure what was going on in that house. There's no way. Because I know what it was like to endure that. And my daughter, even though she has a very, very strong spirit in her own way, she has this light in her that has been silenced in me. That light does not exist in me anymore. And it still, to this day, exists in my 13-year-old daughter who's playing with my two-year-old son. She's homeschooled. She's the greatest girl. <clears throat> Did, did God have my dad do that? And if God did have my dad do that, then I'm quite okay with it. Because whenever I look at the man that I became, I needed, there was a cycle of abuse going through the bloodline in the men in my family, and I broke it. And I'm proud to be the man that broke it. I'm proud to sit here and have this conversation with you. I'm proud to write books about it, stand up in front of other men to talk about it because my dad was a fucking coward and he would never be able to do what I did. He beat the strength into me because he was a coward. And I understand that now. That's like the biggest understanding that I have of my life. I was made to suffer as a child so that now when I'm a 40-year-old man, on August 31st at 11.31 in Dallas, we can have this conversation. And if I didn't have that happen, then no situation in my life would have happened the same way and we wouldn't be having this conversation now, bro. That's just the way it is. Dude, I'm so thankful that you shared this story with me, man. Because uh, a lot of guys won't talk about things. They won't talk about tough stuff. And before I hit record, when we're in the green room, I go, hey, man, is there anything 
that I cannot ask you. And you're like, no, ask away. And I value that so much. And I think guys need to hear this because this should be the norm of when two guys could get together, talk. And man, I almost teared up when you were talking about that stuff because it's, it's beautiful that you, you had a, you had the tough hand, you know, the tough backhand of father, but you turned it into the beautiful, nurturing, loving father that you are today because you made a choice to break a generational curse. Let me ask this question because I think this happens a lot to, to guys who have had harm or early childhood trauma, right? My, my early childhood trauma was I had a guy in the church who didn't show me any love and respect in a healthy way, actually took it the far opposite way. And for a while, you know, I look at God, I go, God, where were you when that was happening, right? Where were you when this? Where was my, my mom and dad, right, when these kind of things were happening? And, and it caused anger that I didn't even know that I had, right? I just kind of blacked it out, blanked it out, and, and moved forward. When it comes to this, you said, I denounced God for a time. But in our conversations, like God came back into the story. How did God come back in that story when he could easily be the villain in your story? Um, <laughs> well, the fun thing is, is whenever you realize that God was there all along, right? Like, that's the fun part. Like, it was all. You know, like even we talked about my tattoos whenever I first started, when we first got on a conversation, my first tattoo is on my back and it's Spider-Man. And, you know, I got it right around the time that the first Tobey Maguire movie came out. And so everybody thought that I was some comic book fanboy. And I'm like, no, you have no idea. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> so anyway, man, whenever I was a kid, you know, Spider-Man used to protect me from my dad my dad would lock me in my closet and uh and every time he did spider-man was in there and i would play with spider-man and i would have conversations with spider-man and i got to the point to where i i got to a point to where i would look forward to being locked in my closet so that i could see my friend And that was God. And so I have like all these instances in my life where I should have died, where something really bad should have happened to me. And every single time there was somebody there telling me that I was in the wrong place and that I was chosen for something. I remember whenever I was like 16 years old, I was out with my friend on new year's in the middle of the night and we were driving my chevy s10 my little pickup truck that had no weight and no traction and there was black ice everywhere and before you knew it we were sliding sideways on the ice and we slammed into a light pole the light pole break over the truck we're just like stranded uh we were able to get a call to my mom who hung up on me because she thought i was joking <laughs> <laughs> it's like the middle of the night so anyway there's black ice we can't you know we we get a call to 911 anyway i don't it it doesn't matter to go into the entire story but uh you know this cop showed up a cop that i knew that i saw multiple times in my life i ended up working for police officers Every single time in my life where I was going through some struggle that was based off of the abuse that I faced as a kid or just not having my father there, some grown ass man appeared for whether it was a period of a, a five minute ordeal or they were in my life for five years and they took me in and they mentored me through whatever it was that I was going through. And then they disappeared. And, and it's so funny because a couple of these people I have in my life, I, I still have in my life. I still very much have in my life. I can pick up the phone. I can call Mike Potter. I can call Chris Caballero. These are police officers that I've known for a long time. I can pick up the phone, call 
Jason Rawlings, a good long friend and investor. I can pick up the phone. I can call so many people. But some of the men that have made the most impactful direct changes in my life, it's like they don't even fucking exist on this planet. I've looked in LinkedIn. I've hired private detectives. I've given every single spelling of a name that I could possibly remember. And and they, they're, they're not the... And so whenever I think to myself, why are these men not in my life? Unless they all passed away and there's no recollection or record of them being on this planet, no husbands, no wives, no nothing that I met, whatever. Maybe it was something that was bigger that was just pushing me towards this path, you know? And I think one of the reasons why a lot of us don't talk about stuff like this is because, yeah, it sounds fucking crazy. <laughs> it's uh, whenever you're sitting here and you're talking about miracles that you're witnessed because of your belief and your knowing of a relationship with God, whenever people don't, when people don't have that capacity to think that way or believe that way, they're not mentally prepared to have that conversation. And so usually the easiest response is to attack that. Oh, that's bullshit. Oh, you're full of it, you know. But that's that's the further part of the conversation, right? Whatever happened to men going, man, I've never heard that before. Let me maturely sit here and listen so that I can take this opportunity to learn more. When did we get to the point to where now we know everything, right? We We just know. And we freaking, don't want to listen to anything that challenges us. Yeah, it's freaking Google. The Google mindset is like, ah, I could Google that and I could become an expert on it. Or I've got now Siri and chat GPT and I could write a book or, you know, I could do all these things like with a with a touch of the button. But what I think is really missing is, I don't know, there was a saying, I forget what it exactly was, but it was talking about like for centuries, men had this fire, you know, sit around the fire, talk with each other talk you know why they're cooking up the meat or whatever but like they're they're talking to each other they're sharing stories they're passing wisdom and knowledge but they had this community and uh, you know like now i just think that guys are like ah, i'd rather go play call of duty and you know like with my friends but that's not real community man you're you're sitting there shooting you know fake fake you know fake little army guys on the on the screen but you're not really connecting in with these guys you're just yelling at each other and busting each other's balls but i think that 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 being able like you said talk to other dudes, share wisdom and go, I have no clue. Let me sit and listen. I think that's missing. Yeah. Um, and the community is missing. A lot of the social gatherings of men are based upon negativity and violence. Like we don't even need to think about gangs. Like, like you just talked about video games. Uh, yeah, I guess it's fun and cool and everything to sit around and cuss at a bunch of kids. <laughs> but, you know, but, but, but where is, but what are we learning here? And so you have these people that are sitting around and they're destroying things in video games. And then you have car groups and bikers and stuff that are identifying now with this term squad. And it's based on violence. I mean, like, man, whenever I was a kid, I watched Michael Jordan play basketball with a whole bunch of other guys. And man, I wanted to grow up and be like Mike. And so we had these huge positive influences. We had role models. We had people that would come to our school and they would say, kids, don't do drugs. I mean, it was this it was this huge thing to build us up. But now, if you're famous, then you have followers. And so a lot of the people that we call influencers, yeah, they might have a lot of influence, but the message is wrong. You can have influence and not be a leader. And I think that that's what we have now. We have a bunch of influencers, but there's no leaders and there's no role models. Mm -hmm. The influencers are using the clout to sell things. Instead of using the clout to get a good message across to make any kind of social change. And then even whenever you have somebody like Chris Pratt, 
that accepts an Academy Award and he gets on stage and he says, the only reason why I'm up here is because of God. Well, then he has a bunch of men attack him online and call him a bitch <laughs> and tell him. So again, it's all the same problem. It's, it's all the same problem. Men are not men right now. <laughs> it's so crazy, right? Here's a guy, Chris Pratt, right? I, my, we watch his videos. We love him in Guardian of the Galaxy. We love him in uh, uh, Jurassic, whatever they, they were. And, and yeah, he goes, man, I attribute this to God. And then people attack him. Right? right but it's armchair warriors right they're sitting on their couch their their thumbs do all their typing and it's just like man instead of going you know what even if we have a different belief than you good on you that you that you believe in something right, right. <sighs> jeez but that's yeah, I, not even that's not even men that there's another problem that we haven't even touched on that's americans we're americans we're supposed to embrace differences in other people. What happened to that? Oh my God. Like I go out whenever I, I, I don't have any near me right now, but whenever I go out and network or I go out and especially whenever I'm wearing suits, you'll notice in my suit, I have a flag on my lapel. And so whenever I go out, I always give out flags to people that are wearing suits or jackets. I'm like, Hey, your jacket's missing something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then it gives me an opportunity to make a connection. But the connection always starts with, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm an American and I'm here to support you because I'm an American. How can I help you? Because I'm an American. What happened to that? So that, it all falls in with the underlying problem. How are men supposed to band together whenever we've completely forgotten the principles of the country that we lived in? We we sold that idea to other countries who are now stronger and more united to us than us. And now we're becoming their labor. <laughs> Man. Wow. <laughs> so until we all sit around and we talk about this and we start coming up with solutions like I have this investment firm. If you come into my firm, then we can teach you and educate you on this. We can make your behaviors better. We can build your business, you know, whatever you have that, you know, you have your platform that you're building and we men start coming together, building these platforms, building these communities and realizing that Josh is not my competition, you know, you know, like somebody might say, well, Josh is this really good looking guy, you know, and he has this podcast. And if I, <laughs> if I go on his podcast, then he's going to make me look bad. No, no, man. Like, Josh is so sexy. <laughs> so, if I make a clip, it's just going right, to be right. that. Josh it's just so going to be that. Josh is so sexy. And me just looking in the camera. <laughs> no, here's the thing, man. Like, <laughs> like, it's as silly as it sounds, it really is like a light switch. It really is like a light switch for us to make the decision to go, that makes sense. And then have a conversation. And it really just starts with making the decision to have the conversation. And if somebody's really, really wanting to have the conversation with a good friend or their brother or their dad or something like that, and they don't know how to start the conversation, share this podcast. That would be a good way to start the conversation. Man, that's share cool. Share the podcast. Say, I, I want to listen to something with you. Yeah. Do you have a podcast there, Jason? I just started recording content for yes. the real, 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 real Chase Jason. You know, so nice. So yeah, man. So yeah, so we're gonna flip calendars and then we're gonna do this again. You know, Heck and yeah. so you're gonna be you're gonna be on my show too. Man, that'd be awesome. So what what what's the name of the show? Because I'll I'll I want all my yeah. listeners to go check out what you got going on. Hopefully, it's the real Jason Criddle. So yeah, we have jasoncriddle.com and we just. There's nothing on there yet. It's a blank website and we're putting on content, but it's uh, cool. it's called The Real Jason Criddle. And cool. so all my social media stuff, it's been The Real Jason Criddle for years. I figured that that would just be the easiest. You know, but everything that's about me online is I, I have, I, there's a lot of business and there's a lot of PR where I was on somebody's show or I was on the news, but it was in their format. The Real Jason Criddle is just my life. Yeah. Conversations like this, this is my life, man. I didn't, I'm not having this conversation with you for this podcast. This is my life. 
if I don't have a conversation like this with somebody, then I'm not having a conversation at all. If I go to Taco Bell and you ask me, how are you doing? You better fucking be prepared to have a conversation <laughs> with me. Yeah. What, uh, what are the names of your book? I'm looking for, I'm looking for your books. Where could, uh, what is the name of them and where could we find them? Um, you know, uh, the most recent, the most recent one would probably be smarter living. I wrote this, what was called the rough draft edition. It wasn't edited or proofread or anything like that. And I put it out, but then the breaking points, um, the breaking points are pretty good. I haven't put any books out in a while. Okay. I'm trying to change that, man. It's been yeah. about five years since I wrote a book. So. Well, that might, I, that might right, need to I got change, into, right? <laughs> right. I got into writing on blogs. I got into writing on yeah. Quora. I, I joined the YEC and I started doing the Forbes thing. Yeah. And so once I started doing that, man, I realized that I had probably written about two or three million words online, but I wasn't putting them in books anymore. Yeah. And so, so yeah, I just, just launched a new book that's only available as a downloadable PDF on jasoncriddle.com it'll probably be there whenever <laughs> whenever somebody reads this but it's called maximizing returns the use of convertible notes in small business investing nobody would be interested in that <laughs> uh, i i wrote it i wrote it to speak to investors about a product that we have so nobody ah, that's super cool man all right so jason i know we're going to talk business in the future i know that uh you know we'll 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 find ways to create some deals and opportunities but when it comes to the the passion that you have for men um what question or you know what whatever what you say what that's that's the part where you need to have me going sexy, <laughs> Josh is sexy. When, it, when it comes to the passion you have for men and then it's like, like you Josh is sexy. okay I, I didn't mean to interrupt it was just no, okay, dude, no, I will try I will, to do it with a straight face. I will always pause when someone wants to say that. So yeah, don't don't worry, man. Um you you derailed me. I love it. <laughs> this doesn't happen often. But what what question during this interview should I ask you that you think that just you know that really speaks to the 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 things that men need to hear today? What question should I have asked you? Because we talked a lot about you know a lot of bit different things and we'll we'll talk about business in the future. But what should I have hit on that I missed the mark? Um, I don't think we, I don't think we really missed on anything. I think it's, I think it's step by step, right? Like the very first, the very first thing that I teach anybody, whenever it comes to sales, whenever it comes to relationships, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. It does not matter, Josh. Like, bro, bro, I've sat down, I've talked with husbands and wives, husbands and husbands, wives and wives, CEOs and co-founders. Uh, people that have owned gyms, doctors that own practices, lawyers that are fighting about their practice, mediators that can't get along. And so before we start anywhere, we all need to take responsibility for where we are right now. So we're going to start by being completely honest with who we are today. We're not going to talk about the past. We're not going to talk about any hardships. We're not going to talk about any goals. We're going to take this piece of notebook paper or this notepad, and we're going to write down three things on there. This is who I am today. And it's okay to write anything on there. So if I am Jason Criddle, well, that doesn't count. What am I today? Well, today I'm a, I'm a successful business owner. That's okay. I'm a, I see myself as a great husband and father. That's, that's okay. That goes on the list too. And I struggle with anger from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed. All right. That's honest. So that's a very good place to start. Who are you? Yeah. What do you see yourself as in the greatest in the greatest part of yourself, the greatest part of myself is a great husband and father. And then what am I struggling with every day? I'm angry from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed. And a lot of times I can't sleep because I'm angry. Now that we know that, 
what can we do positively going forward? And that right there is my driver for life, Josh. I am angry. I am angry at my parents that I no longer have the ability to communicate that anger to. I'm angry at my life for not having a G5. (laughs) (laughs) I'm angry. I'm angry at this, that, and the other thing. It's a relentless thing that just digs and claws at me. And we have this whole this whole society out there that's going, oh, you got to stay positive. And if you stay positive, oh, not everybody's positive and not everybody's positive all the time. As a matter of fact, if I were to plug my cell phone into a positive outlet, my cell phone would explode. All the charge from the positive side starts from negativity in the cell phone. Everything positive starts from negativity. So I decided to use my anger to propel myself in life. Instead of sitting around and being mad, the fact that I'm mad from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed is what pushes me to become better every single day. It pushes me to get back in the gym. It pushes me to be a better father. It pushes me to reevaluate things that I say to my employees so that I can go back and I can say them better that day. It pushes me to be angry at my dad for getting mad and beating me whenever I would walk in the room because I wanted to watch Star Trek with him. Because now my son sits in my lap when I turn on Star Trek because he wants to be with me. Like, how weird is that? That there was this grown man that got mad at his son for wanting to be in the room. It boggles my mind, bro. It absolutely boggles my mind to the point to where it's just a driver. It it makes me mad. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that anger has to be negative. And that doesn't mean that anger is hitting walls or shouting at people. That doesn't mean any of that. My anger is just like anybody else's anger. It's a creative force of nature that you can use to change something that you're angry about. But most people choose to take pills or just stew in their anger. And when we take pills, I have a dear friend, a grown man, who has now become like a spokesperson for this pill that he's taken, where he texts me, to tell me how he doesn't care anymore. And it's sad. It's sad to think that we were getting down this road where we were finally having a conversation about how he's starting to think suicidal thoughts. We were finally having a conversation to where he's starting to overcome the fact that he never did anything with his career. And once he hit that point of becoming emotionally vulnerable, He went to a doctor and got a pill and now he doesn't care anymore. So now those conversations, they don't even exist because he literally will tell you, I don't care. I imagine he tells his wife, I don't care. He probably tells his son, I don't care. I can't imagine what else is going on in his life that he doesn't care about anymore. The only thing that he does care about is telling me how amazing this pill is that allows him to not care anymore. And whenever he goes down his soapbox, I tell him that this is what drives me. The anxiety, the depression, the sadness, the anger, the emotion that we're supposed to feel is what drives me. How many men are blocking that out with pot, energy drinks, video games, relentless sex with people that they don't care about? I'm sitting here purposely trying to invite huge problems in my life so that I can overcome them and grow day by day. It's a very big difference in character traits. Hmm. Interesting. Well, let's do this. For the guys out there who want to continue the conversation, they could definitely check out the real Jason Criddle, right? That that'll be a that's a no-brainer. Uh, they could go to jasoncriddle.com. C R I D D L E dot com. Connect with you there. Um, is there another place that you prefer people to start the conversation with? Like maybe LinkedIn or Facebook or Insta or something uh, like that? Yeah. Well, well, hopefully by the time this launches, they can just go to the real Jason dot com. So the real Jason dot com is an actual website along with Jason dot com. And they can come on there and they can fill out a link to come on and talk to me on my podcast. 
Sweet. Super cool. <laughs> Boom. All right, fellas, you heard it. As always, reach out to our guests. Say thanks for being on the show. Thanks for sharing your story, you know, transparently. Thank you for sharing some advice that you have for other dudes. Uh, guys, reach out to them. Say thanks. If you have some advice that you'd like to share, if you'd like to share your story, if you'd like to share some, maybe some things that you've learned the hard way, you want to share it with other dudes, head on over to uncensoredadviceformen.com. Fill out a quick form. And maybe we'll get you on the show next. So then I love you guys and we'll talk to you all on the next episode.